house cleaning details. House cleaning details. Uh, detail number one. Uh, an individual came up to me not that many moments ago and said words to the effect of, so uh, this week are you going to put everything into English so we can understand it? <laughs> and then I said to this individual, well, you know, it's kind of up to you, individual, to raise your hand when you don't understand something. At which point said individual said, well, I don't want to be embarrassed in front of my friends. <laughs> well, my answer to this individual was, chances are if you don't understand it, there are at least one or two other people who will be blessing your name because they didn't have to put up their hand and ask the same question. So, if you have a question, if you have a question, you know, preferably a germane question. You know, if it's a question like, why do zebras have stripes or something like that, uh, see me in my office later. Um, but if it's a question that's more or less germane in the topic, please put up your hand and ask, because you'll be doing somebody else a favor. You'll also give them a chance to hear some other voice besides mine, which is always a blessing. So that's a good thing. Um, that's house cleaning issue number one. House cleaning issue number two is I am told that we have an auspicious occasion today. I am told we have a birthday today. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to tell us what, how, how, much, how much and how many? Or? The number of keys on a piano. Oh, wow, the number of keys on a piano. Let's see, I don't know that. Um, hold on. <laughs> okay, so 88. Can we, can we sing happy birthday? We have a brave volunteer singer to start that because with my voice, you don't want that. But, uh, happy something. birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Harry. Happy birthday to you. Okay. All right, so we are very happy. Happy birthday. Wow, I mean, you must really like this course here, Heart of Entertainment. I don't know. We'll be here next week. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. Well, that brings up the next and final house cleaning issue. The next and final house cleaning issue, for the moment at least, is if you miss a week and would like to hear that week, or if you were here and I just talked too fast or something, you can find the video tape. I guess it's not really that right now, it's some other word for it, but I'm old. So, videotape, or whatever they call it now, is available if you go to the church website. On the front page, there's kind of scroll down, you'll see something about church history course. And then there's a the URL. That's that code you type at the top of the computer, okay? I believe you will have to cut and paste it. I don't think it's a direct link at this point. You'll probably have to cut and paste the code, but it will take you to a page. It's fairly neatly organized, week one, week two, week three, and so forth. Usually I have the third, uh, what is this, Wednesday? I typically have a Wednesday course up online by sometime Friday morning. So that's kind of the turnover time. So for example, if you wanted to uh, repeat last week's lesson, it's there waiting for you. This week's lesson by Friday should be up online. Okay, so that's, uh, I think that's it. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer, please. And then we'll get into our uh, class period. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We thank you for your mercies that are new to us each and every morning. Father, you have called us by your name to be your people. Lord, we ask that as we, as we study and as we learn, you might continue to guide us. That we might continue to be found more and more in the likeness of Christ. Lord, teach us and guide us and enable us to walk in those good works which have been prepared for us. Father, we ask that your blessing upon these proceedings begun, carried out, and ended in your name. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so just a little bit of recap. Um, you know, I really packed a lot of material in the last week, so we didn't quite get everything done last week, so you'll notice if you have last week's notes and the first couple of pages of this week's notes, 
or like last week's notes, and if you did the homework assignment that I gave you, then most of this should be fairly familiar to you by now, so you can go through it quickly. Okay? What are the district's notes? Oh, okay. We... Oh, okay. You're, you're 88 years old. You can't get them. I'll get them. Fall among yourselves. Now, if you were 88, 88 in one day, I would say, get yourself. But since you're exactly 88, there you go. Don't ever say I'm getting here. So, um, first century Christian church, first century Christian church, um, they run afoul of the Jewish establishment, and they tend to run afoul of the Roman establishment, and what you have in front of you on that first page are, are, are just a couple of the charges that were levied against the early church. They accused them of being atheists. What's an atheist? Well, that's what we think it means. But an atheist really is someone who says there are no gods yeah, okay. of any kind. They didn't believe in the household gods. They didn't believe in the gods who lived on Mount Olympus. They didn't believe in. They couldn't. The Romans, in fact, couldn't even quite see how they believed in the Jewish God because this Jesus person. Seems so terribly different than the God the Romans understood as a Jewish God. Um, Christians were, were very, very adamant about the idea that Jesus, Jesus was the, as Scripture says, the visible image of the invisible God. And for the Romans, that didn't compute. So they said, you know what, these people don't even have a God. And for the Romans, that was bad news. Romans didn't care so much about what God you worshipped, as long as you worshipped some kind of God. Oh, and then one other issue about the Romans. There was something they didn't want you to worship. They had a specific God. They had their own kind of idea of incarnation. Anybody know what that was? Mithra? No. Yeah. The Emperor. Is that what you said? Mithra. Yeah. yeah. An emperor. Caesar. Kaiser, really. By the way, one of my pet peeves as a student of Latin, there's probably no soft C in Latin. There's no sound. So, so it's either a K or a CH. So if you hear me say things like Kirka and Kaiser, it's just me being an academician. You can feel free to ignore it because if you do that, everybody looks at you funny. So, so yeah, the Caesars or the Kaisers were considered to be uh, uh, gods. And the Christians refused to worship them. So, atheism. Also, accused the Christians of two particularly heinous things uh, cannibalism and infanticide. Both related. They accused them of, 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 of killing their children and of eating human beings. Why? Uh, because of the communion. Yeah, mis most likely misinterpretation of the Eucharistic meal. In much the same way, if you recall, Jesus is preaching. And Jesus is doing miracles. And Jesus is gaining in popularity right up until about the time when he has a whole big crowd gathered in front of him. And if you recall, he says, okay, my body is flesh for the world. My blood is true drink for the world. Unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you cannot have life within you. And what do people do? They get up and they make offense. What kind of crazy stuff is this rabbi talking about? I mean, things were going pretty well, but now he's saying crazy stuff. What, what he wants us to eat him? I mean, that's, that's horrible, that's ridiculous. What is he talking about? And a whole crowd, one by one, gets up and leaves until there's nobody there but his original disciples. He looks at them and says, Are you guys going to leave too? And, and Peter rightfully says, uh, no, because we kind of burned our bridges. We have got nowhere else to go. Well, maybe that's what Peter meant. What the scripture records of saying is, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words of? Now. Okay, well, the Romans didn't get that. They just saw this as, well, crazy stuff. 
part of this, by the way, was enhanced by secrecy. Secrecy. Christians tended to worship in secret. There are a couple of reasons. One, because they were afraid. We can't ignore that fact. But also because they held what they were doing as particularly sacred. In, in, in the early church, the custom was, if you were a, a seeker, you were curious about Christianity, they would probably let you see the beginning part of their worship service. They'd be happy to talk to you about it. They'd be happy to tell you all about Jesus. When it came time to the Eucharistic meal, unless they were convinced that you were committed to this thing, you would be politely escorted out of the building. And that kind of secrecy tends to build, to build what? Suspicion. People who are secretive are often suspect. So that's what happened. Uh, finally, we get to the idea of lawlessness. Lawlessness. Uh, Anti-government, societal subversion. I don't know about lawlessness, and I don't know about anti-government, but with societal subversion, a good lawyer could have made that mistake. Listen to the words from Colossians 3. Here, we're talking about within the ecclesia, within the Christian community. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. So, so here you have Christians saying, you know, if, if, once you become a Christian, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is anymore. It doesn't even matter what your gender is anymore. It doesn't matter what, what, your, what your, your, your state of freedom is. And that would be a little bit like going up to, you know, if you're from this part of the world, please uh, accept my apology in advance, but kind of like going to Montgomery, Alabama in 1952, saying, you know, it, it really doesn't matter if you got black skin or white skin. How popular would you have been if you said that? That's, that's, that's the equivalent here. Or it would have been like going to a political convention in 1840 and saying, you know, it really shouldn't matter whether a person is a man or a woman. Everybody should have a vote. Remember, it wasn't until what, the 20th century when we could vote. It would be like, I don't know, going to Georgia in, in, in 1861 and saying, you know, it really doesn't matter whether you're born free or a slave. We're all saying. That's how subversive this statement was, because for those folks, your birthright was everything. That was true of the Jews, that was true of the Greeks. You know, Greeks looked down on Jews, Jews looked down on Greeks. All in all, Galatians 3.28, even more subversive. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, no male or female. That was the prevailing attitude of the first century church. And make no doubt about it, it was subversive. Questions, thoughts, troubles? No questions? Okay, I take the fact that there are no questions is that I am crystal clear, or you're so confused you don't even know where to begin. If we take a look, if we take a look at just scriptural sources, for example, if we were to read in, in Acts, we would discover that right after the stoning of Saint Stephen is where we really begin to hear about Saul. And Saul, we're told, is now to use Acts description, use the authors of Acts description, is going about destroying the church. And the next verse says, Saul went about to the households taking the men and the women who are Christians and throwing them into prison. So the implication there, <coughs> excuse me, the implication there is that both men and women were persecuted uh, equally. Now from extra scriptural resources, um, uh, I don't want to get into this too much uh, right now, but suffice it to say that uh, Romans, like to torture everybody, 
but they really like to torture women and children. Especially when they want information. They figured, perhaps erroneously, they figured a man might stand up against torture, but what a woman or a child is going to break. We have far more vicious descriptions of women being tortured by Romans in the name of Christianity than men. That's not to say they both weren't, but that's not a conclusive answer, but that's kind of, uh, that's kind of where it is. Um, anything else? Is this just the church today? Any problem? What's that? Is this a biblical a comment? Or, or, I mean, not man, man or woman? Gay or you, 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 you betcha. I mean, it's, it, it actually, it is, it is huge today because <laughs> proponents, for example, of, of women's ordination or other kinds of women's service in the church will cite this and they'll say, hey, you know, this early Christian church seemed to not have any problem with women doing things. It said there's no difference. In Christ there's no difference. How can we, mortal human beings, make a difference? By the way, folks who will tell you that, you know, it shouldn't make a difference whether someone is uh, homo or heterosexual, will say, well, if there's no difference, if there's no difference between male and female in Christ, and in other places, by the way, it does say that effectively the body is nothing, what difference does it make as long as the relationship is loving and committed and so yes, those passages are used to defend things which the more conservative ranks of the Christian church and then have to work pretty hard, by the way, to refute. Um, so yes, it, it does, it does, these, these are still points of, these are still points of contention, much like what I read last week when I was reading about uh, how the church tended to hold things in common. The church tended to live in a communal society, right? You know, whenever anybody had need, they sold stuff. Sold the field, sold the house, whatever. Hey, there's th three families, and we got three huge houses. You know, honestly, we got enough room in one of the houses for all three families. Let's sell two of these and give some money to the poor. And there are certainly those who say, hey, shouldn't we as modern Christians take a cue from that? After all, it's not Karl Marx who invented from each according to his means, to each according to his needs, it seems it was the only church that invented that. Taking a cue, by the way, from Jesus, who said, hey, someone asks you for your coat, give them your shirt also. So, those kind of things... You are tempting us to go down a road in a discussion, and I don't think you want to push us right now. <laughs> well... <laughs> and I say that because if, if it's true that we're going yeah. to do outreach like we do in this church, yeah. And if it's true what you're saying, that uh, we should share what we have, we could very easily get into the discussion of why do we have such huge churches at such expense when Absolutely. we still Absolutely. have faith and adore the Lord yeah. without such expenditure and use that money for other... I, I, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'll make it even more, I'll make it even more personal. And by the way, I've never tempted anyone to go down a road. I'm not willing to go down myself. I, I kind of hope we'll get past that just because there's a lot of other material to cover. But just, just so it's not to take a chicken way out of here. Um, some of you might know that I was heavily involved in building pipe organs for a while. And you all know about pipe organs, right? They're huge. They're very expensive. They're expensive to maintain. Up until the Industrial Revolution, they were among the most complex pieces of machinery that human beings had ever engineered. Now, many times was the criticism, how would you call yourself a man of God, let alone a man of cloth, when there are people dying in this world? Children are starving, and you want to convince a church to spend $900,000 to build a pipe organ. Or spend a hundred thousand dollars to repair an alley pipe. Oh, so trust me, I know that argument, and I know about. Um, and it's not something that we have the ability to resolve. It is something, however, that I would say all of us have the ability to justify and explain away if we choose to. Is there an easy answer? Um, no. 
Now, where I went with this last week, where I went with this last week, is to suggest that every era has its challenges. And every era has its sins. Every era has its shortcomings. They have theirs, as we'll see shortly. We have ours. I believe that we are called, as we hear in Ephesians, to walk on the path that ultimately leads us to being found, as I said in the prayer earlier, in the likeness of Christ. We are called to be found in his likeness, to walk in those good works which he has prepared for us. Now, now, what that means is probably very different for different people. To a young man that we often refer to as the rich young ruler, because the story appears three times, one he's rich, another one he's young, another one he's a ruler, so we make kind of an intellectual portmanteau of this and call it the rich young ruler. You know the story I'm talking about. He's a guy who didn't listen to Jesus when Jesus said, come follow me. He's a guy who went to Jesus and said, hey, Rabbi, what do I need to do to inherit, well, we translate it as the eternal life, but it's the spiritual zoe that he was looking for, the boundless life, the unfettered life. What do I have to do to inherit this? Then he goes on to read Jesus' credentials. You know, Jesus, I've been perfect. I haven't sinned. I've kept all the commandments since the time I was a boy. The implication is that he knows he needs something else. Jesus runs with that and says, yeah, there's one thing you're lacking. Here are you lacking, young man. Take everything you have. Everything. Sell it. Give the proceeds to the poor. Come follow me. You know how that story ended, right? The man went away sad. Why? Because he had a lot of money. Because the possessions were great. Now, 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 now maybe it's because eBay hadn't been invented yet, and he realized it's going to be one heck of a Mariah sale and all that stuff. But probably not. Probably it's because he couldn't part with it. But you know what's interesting is that Jesus didn't necessarily say that to everybody. Jesus went to uh, dine and even wine in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus didn't say to them, give up everything you've got. Um, Peter apparently had a wife. We don't know a whole lot about her except from potentially spurious sources, but we know that from Scripture because Peter had a mother-in-law who needed to be healed. He had a mother-in-law who assumed he had a wife. I think that's the way it works, right? Um, so there was a household there. Jesus apparently didn't say to Peter, give away your possessions. Although Jesus did say to Peter, give me your whole life. And Peter will ultimately die in the faith. But last week I also wanted to suggest something else that you may or may not agree with. I would suggest to you that at least sometimes it's harder to live for something than to die for something. Resurrection notwithstanding, medical miracles notwithstanding, for most of us we can only die once. Someone comes along and says to you, you know, if you, if you say you believe in Jesus, I'm going to shoot you dead. You might be right, but say, okay, I believe in Jesus. Let me have it. And then you're dead. Once. But to live for Jesus. Okay, I'll give you a personal example. Let me go back on track. See what it's a good life. <laughs> I told you we could go to Yeah, I know. So I'm walking down this sort of young man of a student, the man of college music. Let me see if I can tell the story without getting over emotional. Um, young man, probably, you know, maybe 21, 22 years old. I'm walking down the street. I'm a student at the time of the Madison College Music in New York. I'm walking down the street because I got home late. I had some rehearsals really late. School's in Manhattan, I'm in Queens. Got on the train. I'm on a, I'm waiting for a bus. The next bus is an hour and a half. I live about three miles away. I didn't look like this when I was that age. I was young, I was hale, I was smart, I could walk for miles. I decided to walk. I'm walking through a fairly nice part of town. All of a sudden, this guy comes out of a shrubbery from behind me. Jumps out of a shrubbery. He's holding a 38 caliber revolver. He points at me. And he says, give, give me all your money. I don't look at him and say, buddy, you got the wrong guy. You've 
trusting in the wrong guy because I don't have anything really. I got a subway. I had tokens from Subway. So I got a subway token. You want that? I said, no, no, you, you trust pretty well. You got to have some money. Give me some money. He's waving the gun on my face. I'm telling you, buddy, if I had any money, I'd give it to you. I just want to go home. I'm tired. So, well, if you don't have money, I'm going to shoot you. He looked pretty serious. The gun looked pretty big. So I'm going to say to the guy. I said, well, okay, you're going to shoot me, you're going to shoot me. Here's what's going to happen, man. You're going to shoot me, and then you can go through my wallet and start having money. Then you're going to be a murderer. The second you shoot me, I'm, I'm going to see my God. I'm going to be with Jesus. All my problems are solved. But all your problems are just beginning. You don't want that. The guy's hands started to shake. Tears coming out his face. He dropped the gun. He tells me, peace be with you. Peace be with you, he says to me. And, um, you know what's interesting there? I wasn't afraid. Not one bit. I thought about it later on. But what's happening, I wasn't afraid. And you know what? I wasn't angry either. I recognize that as I do now. You know, bleeding hard liberal. Most crimes are because of poverty. Because of necessity. I recognize that. No rancor to this day. I pray for that man. But you know, it, it didn't take me that long thinking about that to realize that up until relatively recently, there was a professor who gave me a bad grade on composition that I had worked on for a very long time. And he kind of embarrassed me in front of the class because he didn't like the way I resolved my parallelisms. And it took me 22 years to forgive that man. Jesus is being nailed to a cross. And he pleads with his father, forgive them, they don't know how to do it. It was no problem for me to think about dying for my Jesus. On the other hand, there's some little way to live like him. Just to forgive some stupid thing that that professor probably forgot the day after did it. And probably meant no harm. Much more difficult. Okay, sermon over. Um, <clears throat> am I suggesting to you that we should be like the early church? I don't know. I don't know. You, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like my big gas guzzle automobile with the V8 engine. You know, I, I, I don't know, folks. Every generation has its challenge. Seek what yours is. See what God wants you to do. Pray and listen. Um, if you want to know more about that, we'll have to talk about it after, of course. Um, the house church. The house. This is where the only church. This is where the only church. This one is not a picture of a house church. This is just a slide that's up here because I think it's pretty. This is a much, much later construct. I had a picture last week of a house church, uh, archaeologically. We don't have a whole lot of these. Because 2,000 year old houses don't last that long. But probably, if you're familiar with the archaeological digs in Pompeii, that's about the same time period. That's probably what a Christian house church looked like. So here's, here's a typical description. Okay, you can read this um, early church communities, one or more households would form a single house church according to practicalities such as the size of the household. Well, somebody's got to have a house. Can't give it all away. <laughs> Congregations tend to meet the homes of the more affluent, oh, there's an interesting word, more affluent members because they own larger houses. Makes sense? As mentioned, strong leaders in one house might assume leadership throughout a city or a section. A Roman household could be quite large. And by the way, this is where that business of free and slave and kind of comes into play. Roman house would be quite large. In addition to persons related by kinship, households could include free persons, slaves, hired workers, tenants, tradespeople. Usually, the head of the Roman household was patriarch. Some households, oh, here we go, some households early in the church, headed by women. Headed by women. Uh, scripturally, at least one household by a couple, for example, the artisans of Prisca and the who established. Households in three cities, so we have to have some money. Three homes 
They established house churches, and all of them, by the way, you can find the scripture reference for that. Um, women in early Christianity did take on many of the same leadership roles as men within the congregation. One such woman was Chloe. Uh, again, scriptural reference there for you. Just a quick description. Uh, congregants, people who were worshiping, entered the house to the door leading to the atrium. Atrium is going to be the center, center hall. Atrium had a large opening in the roof, let the light in, allowed rain to fall into a pool below. Sounds pretty nice, huh? Indoor pool, atrium? You know, talk, talk about primitive people, man. Okay? This pool was used for washing your hands before dinner, and by the way, it was also used for baptisms. Just a word there. Uh, they tended not to baptize the way we do. Okay? They tended to baptize by immersion. In fact, the Greek word that we get our word baptism signifies nothing more than washing through immersion. Something that gets culturally lost. When my grandmother did dishes, she had one of these big sinks, giant sink with, with two basins. Okay? You had kind of a soapy basin, and you had the rinse water. When my mother did dishes, at least up to a point, you had the soapy basin and the rinse water. Now, me as a man, I take the dishes, I, I do actually do dishes sometimes, but I don't have time. Uh, I, I take the dishes, put some soap on it, run it under the running water, put it in the thing to dry it, take the other one. I probably, I'm not, I'm not proud of this, by the way, I'm just being honest here. I probably use about 15 gallons of water to wash you know, one meal's worth of dishes. I hope it's not that much, but it could be. Especially if I'm talking, which my wife will also tell you I do a lot of, if I'm talking while I'm doing this. Because I'm sitting there, well, then you know, the 12th century day. <laughs> She's got a bow. I tell people we have a strange and wonderful relationship. I'm strange, she's wonderful. <laughs> yes, I know, it's an old joke. Um, okay, so they tend to baptize by immersion. However, that may not be the only way they baptize. It's dangerous, by the way, I believe, to make theology out of praxis. What does that mean? It means... We probably shouldn't go around saying it must be this way just because we have a couple of examples of things being that way. Maybe we shouldn't take it upon ourselves to say God could only work this way. Just a thought. Okay. Um, church community gathered in the, uh, the reclining place, the dining room. It's kind of interesting to note that, uh, that, that the Greek folks did not sit in chairs. Okay, you probably heard this before. They tended to recline when they ate. Probably wasn't very good for digestion. But they did it anyway. Not sure why. Um, at any rate, that's where they met for the service. Services almost always, almost like they were pre lutherans or something. Services almost always included some kind of a meal, some kind of hospitality. They were huge, absolutely huge on hospitality. With that, I want to go through three different kinds of, of, of worship forms. Um, a first kind of worship form that we can go back to the early Christian church to look at is something called the synopsis. Everybody have that? Synopsis. It's a Greek word that just means meeting. And it is essentially the descendant of the Saturday synagogue worship. There came a time when Christians were no longer followers of Jesus. Before they were called Christians, by the way. Were no longer allowed in a synagogue. At first, when they worshiped, they just worshiped the synagogue and the temple like all the other Jews. Eventually, the Jewish community said, you know, you, you guys are following Jesus. We don't like that. You're not welcome here anymore. So they took what they knew and they took it to their own home. If you wonder what the synopsis was like, it's kind of the seeds, if you will, the precursor to what we think of as the liturgy of the Word. Um, it's important to know there's no introductory right, no confession, no gloria. If you look below that, or the next page, I'm not sure how your page is formatted there, uh, it says structure. And what we have from original sources is a reconstruction of what you did at the synopsis. So there was a 
greeting and a response. Maybe the oldest greeting or the response there is in the Christian church. And uh, some, you know, wag who tend to refer to Lutherans as the frozen chosen. Which not the only frozen chosen. Well, you know. How do you, I mean, how do you get Lutherans? And by the way, what's with Catholics and Episcopalians too? How do you get them to actually speak up in a church? The Lord be with you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Or peace be with you. <laughs> well, I was actually with your spirit. But that's all right, you know. Uh, May the force be with you. Well, yeah, actually, that's the same. It's actually that's actually the same kind of thing. You know, that whole that whole force thing is 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 probably actually a um, a metaphor for a kind of belief that a lot of people have called dualism. There is the good side and the bad side. God, the devil, uh, you know, the angel, the devil sitting on your shoulder. Yeah, that's kind of a metaphor for that. Exactly. Exactly right. Um, so, greeting, elections. They would have, this, this sounds familiar to you. Old Testament reading. A song. Most likely song, by the way. A, uh, I, I want to put it in quotes, New Testament, because that term wasn't quite used, but we'd understand that. And then you see in parentheses it says canonical. And, and, and the reason is because in the early days, the canon was still up for grabs. If you are a Protestant, today's New Testament has how many books? 27. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. So, so, but at the time, early Christian church, there were a few books that were not accepted, generally speaking, as canonical. Canonical here meaning authoritative. We would say the inspired word of God, Lutheran church probably. Um, Revelation. Yeah, well, even, even Marty didn't like that one. Oh, man. That's another Bible study. Um, okay, we go through that. Gospel reading. Homily. Yes, even in those days. A sermon. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the way that you... In good Jewish tradition, you, you know, right now... See, see how we are right now? I'm standing up here sweating it out. You guys are all sitting there, all comfortable, you know, with iPhones and everything. In those days, you said. In those days, I'd have a nice, big, comfortable chair. Oh, you guys can stand up. <laughs> anyway, um, tends to limit the sermon. Though. Well, there you go. It does. It doesn't limit mine. I may be a big fat guy, but I can keep going. <laughs> um, the Old Testament reading. Depends, where, depends on where they were. Um, if, they were in, if they were in a church that was part of the Hellenized parts of Judea, or later on, if they were just in a Greek area, there was by then a Greek, there had been a Greek translation of, of the Old Testament, something called the Septuagint. Um, right, and so there was a Greek translation of the New Testament. It was actually very valuable for study purposes to, for us to this day. Um, but yes, they probably, if they were in, in Gentile areas or Hellenized Jewish areas, they'd read in Greek. Uh, the Church of St. James, say in Jerusalem, undoubtedly read it in Hebrew. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see, this we talked about this briefly before, uh, dismissal of the catechumens. Catechumens, fancy word for uh, people who are studying, they're studying catechism. Today we might call them confirmants. They were, they were dismissed even before the intercessory prayers of the faithful. Think about that. The catechumens, they, they couldn't even pray in the main group. Interesting. And then finally, dismissal of the faithful. So that was the synopsis. Today we might think of that as service of the word. Notice what's missing? Yeah. I'm glad nobody said you all right. That's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's no communion. There's no communion. Because that was thought of as a separate, a separate service. The Eucharist. By the way, uh, Eucharist is from Greek, right? It means Thanksgiving. You've probably heard that once or twice or ten times or whatever. Um, now, how often was the Eucharist celebrated? Is this, I've only really been here just a little shy of a year now, so I don't know everything about the history of this church. Is this one of those churches, I know it's a young little church, as most of churches go. Is this one of those churches where people argue over how many times you should celebrate communion? A little bit. A little bit? Okay. 
Um, you know, uh, the last Lutheran church that I served had only one service. It was the North East, and the church was pretty small. Had one service and had communion every other week. So, what was the schedule? First and third Sundays, and if it was a fifth Sunday, not on fifth Sunday, that was our schedule. Every other week. And there was a push by some folks to have communion every week. And for every action, there was at least an equal and opposite reaction. Because there were other people who said, if you have communion every week, I'm leaving and I'm taking my contribution with me. So, Sayonara. Yeah. Well, I was a kid who was every six months. Yeah, yeah. You know, people, people who have been in Lutheran Church for a long time and a little older than myself will talk about communion being you know, twice a year, or communion kind of being quarterly, or communion being on the major festivals, or communion never being on the major festivals because maybe the service too long, or, or yeah, all kinds of other patterns. Um, but uh, it is possible in those days, first session, some Christian churches. The Eucharist was only celebrated once a year at Passover because they were right under the assumption that the Eucharist was a reenactment and anamnesis in Greek of that Passover meal. So that's when they celebrated it. Um, the, uh, uh, it goes on to basically suggest that, that didn't last very long and uh, Eventually the form, eventually the form pretty much became what? Every Sunday. Sunday as kind of, what did I write there? A mini Easter. That too, by the way, was controversial. Jews, you know, you probably see all the Jewish folks getting together on Sunday to go to the synagogue here, right? Yeah. No, you never do. <laughs> right, they, you know, that's what I see here, right? No, they, they never do that because their day of worship is not Sunday. Their day of worship is, is, is the Sabbath, the Saturday, which they probably would prefer to call Saturday because Saturday is named after the Roman god Saturn, right? Um, so, um, yeah, Sabbath, uh, right? Uh, yeah, uh, Sabbath. And that's what Jews continue to do. But Christians, as they moved further and further away from their Jewish roots, they began to say, well, the holy day, the day of worship, is different than the day of rest. So what typically happened on when we think of a Sunday, they go ahead and do their Christian thing, and then if they had jobs, which most of them did, they didn't go to work because it was a work day. The Sabbath was still the day of rest. Uh, by, by the way, something similar happened um, in, in America, especially in New England. Something you may be aware of the fact that in a lot of New England colonies, the Sabbath continued to be Saturday. You couldn't work. You kept the Sabbath. Worship on Sunday, but you had a day of rest on Sunday. And then you may also be aware that there are a few Christian churches that continue to hold the Sabbath, I think I told you this at some point or other, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, for example. Continue to hold the Sabbath at Saturday. You'll never find Seventh day Adventists in the church on Sunday unless they're cleaning the lights or fixing it or something like that. They, they worship on the Saturday. Um, okay, so that's so this is the structure, early structure, early structure of the um, of the Eucharist. Once again, greeting and response. Uh, then we had something called the Kiss of Peace. Um, kiss of Peace. Well, Here's one of the things that, that, that actually they did accuse Christians of doing a lot of. These early Christians were apparently pretty physical people. They, they really felt solidarity and commonality, like they were all a family. And, you, you know, so, some, of my, some of my relatives are Russians, and others are Latinos. And between those two, I come from a highly emotional family. And you know, when those people greet you, they don't just say, oh, let's go on top of I mean, it's kind of a full body hug. Which is a young person growing up in America, I kind of had to get used to. You know, I kind of had to get used to the idea of, like, my, my uncles, like, wanting to kiss. I was like, oh, my uncle. And of course, being Russian, all the heavy beers, too. You know? But that's just how it was. 
know I'm on camera here, but I remember, you know, an, an, an uncle saying, saying to me, you know, I'm talking about 11 or 12, you know, no 11 or 12 year old boy wants to kiss his uncle. And I'm going to clean up what he did. He's kind of, he is still kind of a colorful guy. So, so he said, this is the cleaned up version. He, he basically said to me, you know, come on, put him there. It's manly. It's not a gay thing. What do you do with that? They accuse the Christians of being way too physical with each other. So I'm even saying, you know, these people get together, they basically have orgies. An accusation. Um, offertory. Okay, just another liturgical pet peeve. Offertory. The word offertory refers to the offering of the gifts that will be used for the Eucharist. Offertory refers to the gifts of what? Of bread and wine. So technically speaking, if you have a service of the word and you collect an offering, the thing you sing or the thing the musicians play or whatever should not be called an offertory. And, and, and you know you're going to hell if you mistake that, right? No. No, of course not. That's ridiculous. Um, Eucharistic prayer, okay? This is a Jewish Thanksgiving prayer lifted right out of what they did in the temple with added Christological parts. Um, here's some examples of that. The fraction. The fraction is a big deal. Some Roman Catholic churches, high church Episcopalians, uh, high church Lutheran, if you find any around here, still make a big deal about the fraction. What's the fraction? I don't know. Hmm? What does fraction mean? Not a trick question. Just ordinary. Division. Yeah, fraction, yeah, it could be division, but literally, fraction is what happens when you fracture something, when you break it. Okay? So, uh, Jesus goes ahead and he takes a piece of bread, does what? He breaks it. He breaks it. Just basically, he describes it as his body. Broken for the world. So, so early Christian church, to this day, some Roman Catholic churches, especially the really high church, same thing with Anglican um, and uh, high church Lutheran, not too many Missouri Synod high church Lutherans, well, there are a couple of them. Some of the ELCA churches are really high church. They make a big deal about the fraction. A priest or the minister will take this kind of larger kind of a wafer, uh, ostia, the host, is the proper term for that, will uh, hold this thing up. And then the president of everybody will break this thing and show them this. There are whole pieces of music that were composed called fraction anthems. Basically, you just stand there and don't. You just stand there and hold this thing while your choir sings a five minute piece. Um, I've, often, I've often wondered about that statement and, you know, <coughs> the, the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. Because Christ's body was not broken. That's correct, yeah. And so, and they refer to the to the host as the body of Christ. Yeah. So it's a, it's a what do they call that? An oxymoron, perhaps. An oxymoron. Yeah. 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 So I'm all, often wondering about it. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is true. As a matter of fact, there's scriptural prophecy that suggests that as badly beaten as Christ was. You know, what I mean? does anybody see the the, the, yeah. the Passion of Christ movie? Yeah. Okay. Once I hit the set, it's probably pretty accurate. Okay? Even though he was beaten, scourged, Scripture will tell us beyond recognition, so badly beaten, that you couldn't recognize him. You know, a little swollen and cut up and bleeding. Yet not a single bone in his body was broken. Which, by the way, has Passover significance, but uh, that's, a, that's another thing altogether. So, so, yeah, the idea, so when you sing anthems like Bread of the World, Bread of the world now broken, Christ's body now broken, it does give one pause. What's that about? His skin was broken. His skin, his skin, his skin was broken, his face was lacerated, uh, his spear had thrown out him, uh, arms had and legs had holes in them. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty broken. So I, I guess if you're looking for a simple answer, that's actually probably a pretty good one. It, 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 okay, his bones aren't necessarily broken, but his body is broken. And maybe more to the point, the risk of getting all theological on you, his heart was broken. The heart of Jesus was broken. Not only over in the words of one hymn, friends his cause disowning. But perhaps
perhaps it's the sin of the whole world. Do you think God's heart breaks? Absolutely. In our phraseology. And maybe one of the things we need to do as Christian people in our journey to become founding with Christ is to allow what breaks God's heart also to break ours. Well, one of the things in the Bible that mm -hmm. says about it is not, not being broken is that the practice was if it was taking too long for them to croak, they yeah. would go and break their legs. Absolutely. Hand. Absolutely. That's, that's the primary reference, by the way. Yeah, right. Uh, with, with a scriptural, and this, this was done with a full scripture kind of reference. <laughs> Um, but dead. yes, that, that's, absolutely, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, the Roman soldiers, you know, they don't want these bodies hanging on the cross. And we're told that in at least one gospel account, this was the eve before the feast, the day beginning of sundown. So we don't want those bodies hanging on there at the feast. Or the Sabbath, as you might hear elsewhere, depends on how you look at it. Synoptic or other discussion. Um, yes, ma'am? Um, do you think that uh, breaking, you know, broke down, that means that when he was on the cross, the Romans broke him down, and they told the Christians, look, he's gone, he's dead. They didn't know that he was last day. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think oh, that, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the, that's an excellent point. One of the things that accompanies the stories of the resurrection, in any gospel we're trying to look at, is an element of divine surprise. Right? Now, depending on what gospel you read, you determine to whom you think it is that met Jesus first. You can take it just as kind of a solitary account. So, Jesus encounters Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb to mourn. How many times has Mary Magdalene heard Jesus say, well, the disciples, you know, on the third day of Christ again? goes right over her head, right through her spirit. So there she is, weeping her eyes out in the early morning light. She is so distraught, it's so unexpected, here comes her best friend in the world, one who cast seven demons out of her, and she thinks she's a gardener. Doesn't recognize at all. Okay? Then when she goes back to tell the story, well, you think the men fall. Hey, you think they would. Well, Jean Mary, what do you expect to say? No, they think she's nuts. <laughs> People don't believe this. You know, it, it goes on and on like that. There's another story, one of my favorite. You know, Cleopas and the other guy are walking down the road. There's Jesus. Well, the other guy, I was going to say, we can figure it out. But it's Cleopas and the other guy, we'll call him Joe, walking down the street, talking about the events that just happened. How horrible this is. There's Jesus come up walking beside him. Once again, they don't recognize, even when he starts talking scripture to them, they don't recognize it. And when they finally do figure it out, when he breaks the bread by the way, and then vanishes, they're overjoyed, they're shocked. They have surprise. So you're right, nobody really expects this to happen somehow. They should have, they didn't. Human sinfulness, human limitation. So the Romans, least of all, expected this to happen. So yeah, the Romans expected that they broke Jesus. In that sense, yeah, broke down, he, he quelled that movement. I'm assuming the Jewish establishment thought the same thing. Caiaphas and his followers thought the same thing. Okay, we solved that problem. Except that it wasn't, he wasn't broken. He wasn't broken. The joke. It's not even on the Romans. The joke is not even on the Jews. The joke is on the last enemy. The joke is on death. Death could not hold him. Jesus makes a mockery of death. Oh, death, where is that statement? Uh, last service we have for you here, uh, the Agape Feast. Um, this is sometimes confused with communion. It's not. Um, uh, the agape meal may have been celebrated along with the Eucharist, but make no mistake about it, it is a separate <coughs> event. Um, uh, agape just means, means love, and you know, and people won't, you know, maybe this is what, you know, Romans got the idea, people are a little weird. They 
celebrate a love feast. A weird name or something. Let's go to the love feast. Really, is that like a love shack? Or? <coughs> it's the love feast. And uh, essentially, it was a stylized meal, but with real food. And um, there's, your, there's your structure for it. Once again, introductory prayer. The meal. Um, here we see some of the first divisions, by the way, between the Eastern and Western churches. Um, very, very ceremonial kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of a, a high point of a lighting of a lamp. Um, and go through all of these kinds of ceremonial things, which are very much like a traditional Jewish meal. Um, in short, here's your summary of early church liturgies. Um, by the end of the first century, standard Christian liturgical observations would be as follows. On Saturday, the Sabbath, you would typically attend the synopsis. Remember, the synopsis just means meaning. On Sunday morning, you'd attend the Eucharist before dawn. You'd go to work on that day, most likely. And in the evening, you would attend a godly meal at the house of a presbyter, or perhaps the bishop's house. So that was it. That was your, that was your weekend, so to speak. So it wasn't your weekend, because Sunday was a work day. And one day off, Saturday, you spent that in church. Let me stop here because we're about to go into a new century. Uh, any more questions? Or questions I failed to answer, or questions I didn't leave? I've often wondered, and I think it's related, I can't pronounce when they were, one of the things that the church had was a, uh, a, a set of, did they start the Adachi meal, or, I mean, uh, the order of, of service. That um, no one really knows where it came from. Um, so make it, make it the attempt, make it attempt to pronounce it. The or something like that. Well, there's the, there's this agape no, meal no, that we're talking about. Um, no, this was this was how you do the community. Okay. That, that there was instructions on. Well, there's 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 the. Uh, we're gonna actually we're actually gonna get we're gonna get into that in a moment actually. See if see if it's what you're looking for. I'll leave, that, I'll leave that as a surprise for you. See if that's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, and, the reason, and the reason it's hard to pronounce because it's a proper way to pronounce it, and it's an anglicized way to pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce it. Well, sure. Okay. Um, other questions? Troubles? I just, just every, well, your entire presentation, I, every once in a while comes back to my mind. The thought that so many of these people at that time thought that the end was near. They sure did. Yeah. And a lot of what they did was in that context. Yeah. Yes, ab ab absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. There was definitely a sense um, among early Christians, uh, especially that first generation, yeah. that felt that Jesus would be kind of, Jesus' return, bodily return, was imminent. That a new resurrection life was, 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 was imminent. So yes, uh, if you want to draw that analogy, they did a lot of the things that, uh, say, the Millerites and then subsequent Neo-Millerites uh, did, as well as folks uh, turn the, one, the first time of the money uh, did. There's a lot of that kind of thing. The sense that, you know, it's a horrible old joke. Uh, pastors in his office doing whatever pastors do in offices. Church secretary sit at the desk, you know, running the church. Church secretary looks out the window and sees Jesus walking down the lawn. Come on, you've all heard this joke. Church secretary calls, you know, Jesus, Jesus is walking down the lawn. She gets on the intercom and calls the pastor. The pastor says, uh, you know, Pastor, what, what do I do? I, I, I see Jesus is walking towards the church. What do I do? The pastor goes into absolute panic. He gets on the phone and calls the bishop. Or maybe it's a district president, I don't know. Anyway, district president says, well, Look busy. <laughs> um, but in, in, in serious, in seriousness, in seriousness, if you forget about this little part of no man knows the day or the hour, if you forget about that, and uh, you know, and, and, and I might maybe somebody with a lot more charisma than I have convinced you that Jesus is coming back on October twelfth. 2014. And you really believe this. How, how concerned are you about paying off your mortgage? How concerned are you about your stock portfolio? 
your investments. How concerned are you about the neighbor that still owes you a thousand bucks from a couple years ago that he's never paid back? How concerned are you about whether or not your kids finish their college educations? What's your primary concern? Kind of. You know, I mean, it depends on where you are, what your theology is, but you know, if you, you might be thinking, I better tell as many people about this as possible. Or you might be thinking, I better make sure my own house is on there, make sure I'm living right. You might be thinking, well, let me just be joyful, because this is what I've been looking for. But my guess is you probably would be right. You wouldn't be all that concerned with things of this earth, would you know? Okay. <coughs> um, by the end of the first century, and, and on into the second century, um, church hierarchy gradually starts to take form. You know what hierarchy means, right? Hierarchy means that um, there's something real important here, and something less important here, and something a little less important here. Military is hierarchy, right? Okay, so, and the bottom, you know, you know, you know, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and way, 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 way at the top, there's a commander in chief, and then everything, you know, in between, right? Um, hierarchy is beginning to take place in the church, and and that's kind of an interesting thing, and, and it sheds some light on this idea. But I remember before I was saying, you know, in Christ there is no male or female, Jew or Gentile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yet God is still a God of order. For pragmatic reasons, there's still order. You need to have some kind of order. At least you believe, beings believe you need to have some kind of order. One of the criticisms, by the way, that liturgical churches, like Lutheran churches, get from churches that claim to be non-liturgical, like Pentecostal churches, for example, will say, oh, you guys are following a man-made structure. This liturgy you have is a man-made structure, and you don't leave any room for the Holy Spirit at all because you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. You just follow a script that's in a book. Or over in the Dutchess case, I But having been to enough Pentecostal services, I've got to tell you that those churches, although it doesn't look like it at first blush, are at least as liturgical as any chancel, prancing, high church, Anglican place you want to go to. Because they pretty much have order. It's ingrained. And it's the same every single week. They may think they're free floating in the spirit, and who am I to say they're not? But I've got to tell you, like clockwork, you can predict what's going to happen in the service. Things just fall into order. I know second law of thermodynamics tells us the other way it's around, but humanly speaking, things have a way of falling into an order, a natural order of things. So this is where it begins. We have a, a couple of different offices, so to speak. We have episcopos. Episcopos. That just means bishops. You know, words like episcopalia to be ruled by bishops. Okay? We have uh, presbyters. <coughs> or we get words like presbyterian. Pre presbyter is an elder. In Greek, presbyteros. It's a, an elder. And finally, deacons. Again, from Greek, the Athos. It's a uh, servant. So those are your officers in a church. Okay? You've got bishops, you've got presbyters, you've got deacons. The episcopal structure that was ruled by a bishop becomes thoroughly ingrained in the second century. And what's interesting is the structure was enforced by the teaching of apostolic succession. What's apostolic succession? From Peter on down. Well, here's how, here's how it works. And you, you probably associate that with something Catholic. And those of you who are Lutherans, even if you do know what it means, you don't know what it means. I know. Apostolic succession works like this. The thought is that Jesus gave certain abilities to those first apostles. Specifically, by the way, the ability to convey the Holy Spirit to other people. And there are some verses in Acts, especially, that, uh, that, that, would, that would back that up. There are some other verses that don't, but, you know, the Bible studies like that. So the idea that Jesus makes the first apostles what does Jesus do? Well, he's the Son of God. He can do it. Jesus makes the first apostles. The apostles then make other apostles. And so on down the line. Once upon a time, there was a, a district within the Lutheran church, Missouri 
said. I, I worked there, but I'm only it nameless. Um, it was, you can figure it out, I suppose. It was a district, and there was a church that called itself the Catholic Apostolic Church. They were a post Millerite, millennialist, Anglican group. So in other words, they believed that Jesus was coming back somewhere on the human And they worshipped in kind of hybrid, ultra high church style. They had smells and bells and all kinds of fancy vestments, and they spoke in tongues like nobody's business. Well, they were very serious about the idea of apostolic succession. They were so serious about the idea of apostolic succession that they were not going to break that rule. Except they were also convinced Jesus was coming back on or about 1900. I have no idea what mathematical formula they used for that. They figured this out. But you know what else? They were also very sincere. So when Jesus failed to return, at least in bodily form in 1900, they assumed it wasn't the fault of Jesus, it wasn't the fault of their religion, it was just the fault of their mathematics. And they figured, well, we know we're off, but how far off would we be? So, only a few years. To make a very long story short, they made no provision for the succession of the episcopate in that denomination. In other words, there was no way of making a new bishop. And according to apostolic succession, only a bishop can consecrate the lesser ministers. So without a bishop, once the lost bishop died, you had no more priests. You had no more deacons. I was told the last Eucharistic service was celebrated in that church somewhere in the 1940s. Because you have to be a priest to celebrate the Eucharist. Well, somewhere around the 90s, there were four elderly men who were now the entire denomination, owning a property of great value in a major city. And since they're all in their 80s or thereabouts, they're saying, you know, we really, in good conscience, cannot continue to call ourselves a church. We don't have a priest. The last subdeacon died somewhere in the 60s. Haven't had communion since World War II. It's just the four of us, and we own this property that's worth millions of dollars. We have got to unload this property at some kind of not-for-profit organization, or our descendants are going to have the mother of all capital gains taxes. They own it. They're the church. So um, they decided to gift this to a particular district in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. They go to the district president and said, we'd like to give you this church because your theology is the closest one we found to ours. Don't know if that's a compliment or not, that's what they said. But there's one catch. You can only take it if you have apostolic succession. What's the problem with that in Missouri Synod? The Missouri Synod is anti sacerdotal as touching the idea of, of um, absolute succession. So the district president thinks fast and realizes, after some consultation with local historians, that there was some connection between that particular district and the Finnish Lutheran Church, which does believe in absolute succession. Problem solved. One of the Finnish bishops made one of our bishops, even though we don't really call them that. They are. The four old guys, sorry, I should call them a better term. The four old guys looked at each other, shrugged their shoulders, said, okay. Why not apostolic succession story? <laughs> um, okay, so apostolic succession, huge, huge uh, idea in that early church, regardless of what we think of it. Very, very real to those people. Um, each Christian community, the text goes on, each Christian community had presbyters um, who were ordained and assisted the bishop. Um, Christianity spread, especially in rural areas. Uh, it was in the rural areas, by the way, the presbyters exercised most authority, mainly because the bishop couldn't get there so quickly. Um, and uh, that's, that's it. Now, it, it may be on a different page. Your notes are probably different than mine. Maybe on a different page. The sense of developments in the second century. Is that the word you're looking for? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Developments of the second century. Well, we're looking at something called the Didache. Uh, 
I did it, Daddy. Well, look how long I died at. And it is, by the way, where we get things like uh, didactic, meaning to uh, teach. Because what that was, dating from about 70 A.C.E., what that is is really probably the first Christian catechism. At least certain sections of it were catechetical. They talk about faith. But the parts that didn't talk about faith describe ritual. So in that way, it was more like what, what the Catholics would call a breviary. It described the rituals and what you were supposed to do. How do you go about baptizing someone? How do you conduct the Eucharistic service? How do you do any of these things? Well, the DDK went ahead and described that. Why? So that there would be order. That was a development of the second century, by the way, as a page. That's a good yeah. misspelled up there. <laughs> well, here's the reality. I, I, I read Greek and would find that very difficult to read. Because you notice, I guess they were short of space or something, because there's no spaces. There's no punctuation. Very hard to read. Okay. Um, what is it that said? Get together seven different fill in the denomination you want to write on, get together seven different Methodists, and you have 11 different opinions, right? Um, we could get into light bulb jokes really quickly. You know, how many Missouri City Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? None. Lutherans don't believe in change. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, those kind of jokes get it, it really, really abstract where you really kind of have to know the church body to, to know that, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, how many, how many liberal Unitarians does it take to change a light bulb? It doesn't really matter. You should definitely ask the light bulb who wants to change first. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not that funny. I don't know. Um, Okay, so uh, we, we, get into, we get a bunch of people together. It doesn't take them very long before they start arguing. And one of the things they wanted to argue about, it seems, was uh, the day of Easter. When do we celebrate Easter? And, and here's kind of how it worked. Up until late second century, we had this disagreement, this terrible disagreement. Some people almost got excommunicated over this. Okay? Um, Western churches had one idea. Churches in Asia Minor had a different idea. Specifically, churches in Asia Minor celebrated Easter on the 14th of the Jewish month of Nisan. And that's a month, not a car for the 14th month of Nisan. 14th, uh, 14th day, it's the 14th day of Nisan. So this is their Jewish month of Nisan, the day before Jewish Passover, regardless of the day of hell. Isn't that interesting? regardless of the day, because they felt it was connected to Passover. And Passover, as you know, will move. Okay, movable feast, so to speak. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, they, um, the other, the, the Western church, the Latin church, okay, quarto decimons, okay, fourteeners, or fourteeners, because they felt uh, <laughs> they called them fourteeners, because they decided that Easter was going to Easter was going to be celebrated on Sunday, following that fourteenth day of the sun. Um, they had this dissent, and it almost became a schism. Now, now think about this for a moment. Paul writes, um, "Is Christ divided?" And the resounding answer should be no. Okay. Well, Paul writes that really, and people argue over who baptized whom. But here's the church dividing itself over well, we want Easter, we want Easter to be on the 14th, no matter what. And here's another group saying, no, Easter should be on the Sunday following the 14th, no matter what. And these people try to excommunicate each other over this. 
don't do things like that today, do we? Just have you think about it. This is after they uh, established Christmas on the 25th or some day, which could be any day of the week. You know, interestingly enough, Christmas wasn't quite so important to them. Um, and the other thing you might as well, it doesn't really come up until much later, but just, just, just so you know, um, and, and, and I guess they decided that you know maybe these days aren't so important after all, because uh, most likely Jesus was born um, when... She was probably born in June sometime. June, yeah. She was probably born in June, somewhere, somewhere around the, the longest day of the year. Okay? And, 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 you know, Jesus and John the Baptist were six months apart, we're told. Some would say exactly six months apart, is what the scripture says. Okay? So it's actually John the Baptist who was born in December, right around Christmas time, the shortest day of the year, give or take. And at some point, for largely political cultural reasons, those things were switched around with full knowledge, by the way. With full knowledge. They just decided to change it. They felt it would be better that way. So um, that's, um, churches, churches do stuff like that. Yes? Uh, I've always heard that Easter was the first Sunday of the first full moon after the equinox. Who came up with that question? That's, that's, because, that's because that's how Passover was determined. Uh, Passover, the Jewish calendar, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. So the way they would determine their months, it has to do with moon phases. And as a result, they don't work out quite the same way. Um, we have how many, how many days in a year? You know, what's funny about that is it's not quite right. It's not wrong either, but it's not quite right. It's a little bit closer answer is 365 and one quarter days. Okay, so it's 365 plus a little bit, but there's no way to put a practical way to put a calendar. Well, here's that quarter day. I mean, what do you, what do you, what do, you do with what do you do with a quarter day? Do you have an extra six hours in one of the day? I, I could use that actually. Right. You're right. 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 I could use that six hours, extra six hours of study. Um, you, you know, what do you what do you do with that? So we have this thing. You know what this is, right? Leap year. Leap year. Yeah. But, 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 the, but the answer is that they use, they use lunar phases to determine these things. Yeah. Um, because that's how the Jewish calendar works. It's a lunar calendar. Um, okay, so, descent, I wrote, schism. Uh, sin. I don't know. Just let you think about that. Dividing the body of Christ over things that really have little or nothing to do with the good news. Would you catch Jesus saying to a guy born blind, you know, buddy, I was going to heal you because God is merciful and th this healing could bring glory to God, but you're, 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 you're celebrating Passover on the wrong day, so you're out of luck. Would we catch Jesus doing that? As a matter of fact, Jesus does quite the opposite. If you'll recall, the religious establishment gets in Jesus' face many times, but one particular time they say, Jesus, why is it that you let your disciples pick up grain on the Sabbath? You know, they weren't stealing, by the way. That was, that was the law, as a matter of fact. If you were a farmer, you were supposed to, the grain to grow on the perimeter, you were supposed to leave that for travelers. But... They're not getting in Jesus' face over the disciples picking the grain, or even picking it up off the floor. They're getting in, their, in Jesus' face as they're doing it on the Sabbath. And you can almost imagine the conversation. You know, first Jesus saying, well, duh, because they're hungry. And, uh, you, you know, uh, McDonald's won't be invented for a couple thousand years, so we've got to make some bread. And the religious establishment saying, but Jesus, Rabbi, you're, you're like a teacher. You're supposed to know that it's a Sabbath. If they hadn't made the bread the night before, they're out of luck. And Jesus is taking that law, some might say flouting it, some might even say disobeying it, but I would suggest you clarifying it in its larger purpose. Jesus is saying, look, by the way, this isn't the Pharisee tradition. Jesus is saying, God made the Sabbath for man. Not the other way around. God didn't make a race of people just so they could keep the Sabbath. 
God made a Sabbath and gave it to all of you as a gift because in God's wisdom, God knows if you need a day to rest and to reflect and to contemplate, otherwise you just work or play yourself to death. But the reality is, what God intended as a boon, you people have turned into a drudgery and an obligation that nobody really wants to keep. So, it, it's very doubtful. Honestly, that Jesus and his Father were of one mind are terribly concerned about what day we keep Easter. Yes, sir? Higher interpretation about you know, the Sabbath could be any day. Mm -hmm. It could be Sunday through Saturday. The point is that you take a day of rest and reflection of God. So if your Sabbath happens to be a Monday, as long as you do that, on Monday, it's fine. It's, it's somehow somebody interpreted it once. Okay, so it doesn't have to be Saturday, it doesn't have to be Sunday. The point is, is that you take that day of rest as God gave you, and you also, you know, reflect on God at that time, as well as rest. Makes sense to me. I think, I think that works. Um, although I would advise you that there are some Christians who would suggest that you're going to go straight to hell if you don't repent of that. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Yeah, something like that. The Church of Monopoly, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, early Christian scriptural canon. Okay. Kind of interesting here. The writings of the apostles. Writings of the apostles circulated among the earliest Christian communities. Remember, they, um, they didn't have computers. They didn't even have printing presses. Anything written represented a great deal of human effort. A lot of man hours going to writing things. Okay. Um, so if you if you had something written, if you owned it, you were probably pretty wealthy. Or very fortunate. Uh, and most likely you have to share it with other people because you wouldn't want to keep such a treasure yourself. Um, Paul's epistles were circulating in collected forms by the end of the first century AC. Um, Justin Martyr, early Christian apologist, kind of historian, writer, mentions the memoirs of the apostles, which by the way, Christians refer to as gospels. They just call these things gospels. So you will find a lot of deuterocanonical or completely non-canonical things with the gospel of Peter, Barnabas, Thomas. They don't seem like gospels to us. They just call them gospels because gospel means good news. Um, and by the way, they, they value these things. They actually consider the, these writings. If it came from an apostle, they pretty much consider that in the same value as I'm saying Isaiah. Um, let's see what other highlights do we have here. Okay, about halfway through that paragraph. Oldest list of books in the New Testament canon. The Monitorium fragment, about, about 170, circa 170. Um, depicts a set of Christian writings somewhat similar to what is now the 27th book in the New Testament canon. Including the four Gospels. Uh, the early Christian church. Last books to be ratified. Last books to be ratified in the early Christian church. Uh, James, Hebrews, and 2 Peter. What's interesting is, fast forward to the 16th century. Martin Luther really wasn't all that fond of Revelation. And, and, and by the way, had some issues with the uh, letter of James. So, yeah. Okay. Well, now we get into something interesting. I don't know if we're going to have time to go through all of this here, but uh, if so, we'll just pick it up next week here. But um, heresies. What's a heresy? Heresy. Doing something contrary to God's word. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what we would think of it. Contrary to right? church law. Yeah, contrary to, contrary to church law, contrary to the accepted system of belief. We'll hear a lot in these first couple hundred word, couple hundred years, the word orthodox. You know, you probably have heard of orthodox Jews, and you've heard of uh, uh, the orthodox Christian church, usually prefaced by what we think of as an ethnicity or nationality, like Greek orthodox or Romanian orthodox or Syrian orthodox. Orthodoxy is the same belief. The same belief is orthodoxy. So the person who does something outside of uh, that same belief is potentially, at least, 
a heretic. So early Christianity saw many, many so-called heresies. Um, it would be kind of fun, I suppose, to do a study on that. It would take many, many weeks to do it because there were so many of them and a lot of them aren't fully understood. Um, but by the time we're studying today, we have three main kinds of heresies. Three main with, with about a thousand different variations. Three main kinds of heresy, or so-called heresy, uh, or beliefs that are outside of orthodoxy. Uh, first one is uh, what we'll call uh, Marcionism. Uh, now, uh, some of this stuff gets pretty heavy, so here's a real simple explanation. Uh, Marcion, that's a woodcut, I guess, or some kind of thing. Uh, I have no idea if it looks like, look like that or not, but it's what I found. Uh, Marcion, second century teacher. Now he was looking at scripture. Maybe you've done this. You look at the Old Testament, and, and, and at first blush, at least, God seems kind of, dare I say it, kind of nasty, kind of capricious. I will harden the hearts of those in my heart. You know, there's Pharaoh trying to be a good guy. If God hearts his hearts, he can't even do the right thing. God saying to his chosen people, go in and possess the land. Even though there are people living that you have to take out. God seems pretty harsh. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, we get into the church age. The so-called New Testament era. And first of all, we have the example of Jesus, who calls God Abba. Uh, Daddy. On an intimate relationship with God. You have the God of Moses. Moses take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. You've got the God of Jesus. Daddy, I know you glorified me. I want to glorify you. you know, it's, we're all one together. Very different seeming things, is it not? You, you've got the God of the Old Testament who makes a world, discovers that all people are evil. Says, okay, I'm going to smash this world, or maybe more properly drown it, but I'll save one family that's not as bad as all the others to so start over again. You have New Testament writings that say God, at least is personified in Jesus, there is no darkness in him, no shadow of turning. Here's the God who repents of the creation he's made, here's the God in whom there is no shadow of turning. How do you justify those two things? Mark and said, you can't. Mark and said, it's two gods. The, the God who made the world, the God of Genesis, the God of the Flood, the God of Moses, was a God, but not the God. Hold him a demiurge, by the way. The God of Jesus, however, is the true God, the real God. And, and that's how Mark tried to justify these two things, by not justifying it. But the early church said, that's not how it is. Mark you're a smart guy at all, but that's not how it is. Mark actually, th those ideas might have gotten by, except there were some other ideas that Marking had, for example, the issue of did Jesus actually come in bodily form and he just look like a man? Did Jesus actually incarnate? That's a common thread that runs through these, these heresies. Um, second uh, popular belief system in the early Christian church, um, Montanism. Uh, named for a Montanus teacher. Again, Powerful teacher. Mazda suggested, among other things, that revelation was not closed. It wasn't just those, it was the second century now. It wasn't just those first apostles who were prophesied. It wasn't just, God didn't just talk to Peter and Paul. God continues to talk to us, said Mazda. And What's really important is not so much the stuff that was written down then, because that was then, those people were all dead. What's really important 
different than what God says to us today. So it's even possible, said Moses, that God may say something to us today that's different from what told people then. God may give us a different revelation as we're different people. Now, one of the characteristics of his followers was that they were ecstatic, literally. When they went into a trance, everybody knew it. They were living, that's kind of the reason for that one kind of there is, they were kind of living the Pentecost life. They believed those gifts of the Holy Spirit, those kind of, those kind of miraculous things, everything from speaking in tongues to, to being able to heal people, that's for everybody. That's for the whole Christian church. In short, they were a lot like um, the Pentecostals or Charismatics of today. Um, you know, I, I'm assuming, probably most churches in this area have a few folks who were Charismatic, a few folks who were Pentecostal. Um, uh, been there, done that. Been there, done that, so I'm not, uh, you know, pointing the finger here. I'm just stating a fact that uh, there are lots of folks today, there's churches all over the place, who believe that God continues to give the gift of tongues. There are lots of folks today who believe that God continues to give the gift of healing, continues to give the gift of prophecy. I was once at a Pentecostal church. Where one of the elders came up to me, I was a young man, I was about 17 years old, and one of the elders came up to me and said, Young man, God's given me a prophecy about you. Of course, I was very interested about this. He said, you know, what, what is it you, what is it you plan to be in life? I boldly said, well, you know, I think I, I want to be a musician who serves God with music, but then I think I also want to be a pastor. So maybe I'll try to be both. And the guy looks at me square in the eye and says, no. God has told me you're not to be either. In fact, God is very displeased with your music. God weeps every time you play the organ. <laughs> well, I'm only 17. I'm hoping I'm going to get better. No, no. That's not the kind of music God wants in his church. And by the way, you're not called to preach. Well, how, how do you know that? Because you want it, says the prophet to me. You want to be a preacher. You want to be up there. You want the education. You want to be able to do this. Well, why wouldn't I? That's not the way God works. I know. We told him. That kind of ended my life in the Pentecostal church, by the way. I'd like to tell you it's because of some theological revelation. It's mostly because of ego. Um, file out of too much information. So, uh, Montanism is very much like modern-day Pentecostalism, believing that the canon of Scripture, the revelation of God, isn't necessarily closed. Uh, finally, we get to Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, not only can we not discuss it in a six-week course, we probably couldn't discuss it in six lifetimes. It's, um, it's, it's too complicated. Has some of the common thoughts of the other so-called heresies but in a nutshell, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis. Gnosis is knowledge, but specifically an exact, specific, and usually esoteric knowledge. For example, um, if I try really hard, I can read that. Once I figure out where one word ends, where the other one begins, where some of the characters are different from, you know, 12, 1800 years ago. And maybe a, a couple of you can, too. I don't know how many classics majors are in here. Maybe a couple of you can also read that. I don't know. The rest of you say it's all our major is major. And uh, I'm going to avoid that. So that's gnosis. I know something you don't know. Gnosis. Special knowledge. The Gnostics said that Jesus came to impart special knowledge that the rest of the world didn't have. That's why Jesus, they said, had a special relationship with God. That's why the early apostles read them such incredible things. They had special knowledge. The way to salvation, by the way, salvation implies being saved. Saved from what? 
save from your own flesh, save from the world, save from material being, the way to be saved was to learn this special knowledge. Gnosticism. They had some other ideas too, by the way. Uh, they had a similar idea, by the way, that, that God was not just one God, it was a demiurge that was flawed, or maybe even evil, that Jesus represented the highest picture of a real God, and also tended to believe that Jesus did not come to the world of the flesh. Why? Because the flesh was evil. So they believe that Jesus, when he came, was not in fact incarnate, which really means made flesh, but appeared as a man. Looked like one for convenience sake, but in fact was a spirit being. Um, that's, uh, um, that's that. So this is kind of a primer, if you will, on second century heresies. And here's my parting shot on heresy. Some of these ideas seem pretty far out. And we read them today, 2,000 years later, 1,800 years later, I should say, and we think, well, these people were cracked. How do they possibly think that? But today, if, if I were to walk up to, say, a Presbyterian and say, you know, I go to a church where, one, not only we have communion every single week, but we have communion, we believe that for the believer, that little piece of wafer and that little sip of wine, that becomes, for the believer, the body, the true body of the Lord. We believe we are actually consuming the, I'm, I'm not asking you all if you believe this. I'm just saying this is what church teaches. Actually believe that. So then, if he's kind of smart, I say, oh, so you believe the same thing the Catholics do? Uh, no. Does the Catholics believe the transubstantiation? Well, then you just describe Christ? No, so the Catholic, the Catholic believes that uh, uh, when you go up into communion, when the priest pronounces it so, this is, therefore, that is, ach est, ach est, becomes that, when the priest says so. Lutherans will tell you that it simply is for the believer. Transubstantiation versus real presence. At, best, at this point, the Presbyterian is making signs like this and slowly walking away from it. Because he knows that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's a memorial of what Jesus did. It's got a lot of symbolic meaning. It teaches us a lot of things. But it's not really the actual body of the water of Jesus. That's ridiculous. We still argue. We still call each other heretics. We're still divided. And I don't want to answer. You know, call me crazy. But I want a church where Jesus, the body of Christ, is not divided. And I would suggest you should want that too. And how are we going to get that? By convincing everyone to think the way we do. No. Prayer. Humility. Because we're not the ones who can do it. No matter how smart we think we are. Only God's Holy Spirit can instill unity. And the best we can do is to make ourselves available to the work of God's Holy Spirit. Okay, let's close the word prayer, please. Father, we thank you for this time you've allowed us. We thank you for all of your good gifts to us right now. We thank you for this assembly and for each and every soul that has gathered in this place. Word where truth has been spoken, we ask that they take root in our hearts and in our minds so that it may spring up and bear other fruit. Send us now on our way, rejoicing and also filled with a desire to serve you and to walk in the good works which Christ has prepared for us. It is in his name we pray and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your time and efforts, brothers and sisters. Any, any, any final questions, Charles?